Hello, and welcome to the 10th episode of Tissues of the Day, a comedy show about queer culture and relationships. Today's episode is about religion. And we're joined today by our special guest, Dan Doomsha. Thanks for coming on, Dan. Hi. Hello. Hi, Robert. Hi, David. Hello. Dan is currently working at the Tightrope Theater, and you can check that out at tightropetheater.com, where he's teaching improv for work and wellness, as well as presentations and public speaking. Um, Was there anything more you wanted to say about Tightrope Theater, Dan? What a great time to start a theater in the pandemic. Yeah. You know, we'll pick it (laughs) up. It's all virtual. It's been amazing to connect people across distances with the magic of improv. So you can check us out for the stuff that we're doing in the midst of the pandemic. That's awesome. Um, Just so people get an idea of like your teaching style, what would you say are like some of your main goals as a teacher when you instruct? The number one goal for me as a teacher is to create safe space so that people feel welcome, included, and that they can take risks without being evaluated or judged. That's my number one piece as a teacher. The second piece is that we're gently pushing people to take risks in class so that they can go further and learn and surprise themselves. That's awesome. When you do improv, um, you don't gently. I mean, when you get on stage, <laughs> you're thrown in the deep end. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And like, yeah, classes are the best place to like make those mistakes or whatever, or like take those risks. And then you feel more secure as a performer, like once you're on stage, you know, I've seen many shows where, <laughs> where players are taking risks on stage and it's like, oh, oh, okay, big choice. And then, <laughs> and you can tell they're like kind of scaring themselves. It's a very interesting energy. Wasn't one of your favorite memories of me, David, between Dan and myself in a scene? It's true. I remember us talking about this. It's true. Yeah, we talked about it once on the podcast. I don't know if you remember this, Dan, but basically you were in a um, you were in a duo scene. Uh, t- Robert was the dance instructor, and Dan was just like kind of a shy like dance student, and. Um, I think the tech improviser then started playing like some salsa music and Robert was like, okay, are you ready for your first lesson? It's time for the penetrada. (laughs) And then he like spins you around aggressively and you start like, you know, bumping and grinding and sort of doing salsa at the same time. Uh, Yeah, it was a good Uh, one. I do remember that scene, yeah. (laughs) Nice. Uh, um, So to break the ice, get the creative mind flowing, we have some rapid fire gut reaction questions. Wait, hold Um, on. Before the questions, did you introduce Uh me, David? Um, (laughs) Hello, everybody. This is uh, my co-host, Robert. Um, he's doing great. Just (laughs) call me the frickin' plant on the side of his desk. Did I, did I say who I am? I'm David. Uh... (laughs) Oh, good. That's We're good. We're starting out with existential questions. It's perfect yeah. for religion. Who am I? Who are we? Yeah. It is. I was debating opening this episode saying, welcome to three gay men disappearing up their buttholes. Um, <laughs> because I think it'll be, I think it'll be one of those conversations. But uh, Robert, do you have Robert. anything that you needed to get off your chest before... Uh, we continue. No, and if the only thing I could say is that you both are probably going to have more on this topic than I, because though I had some exposure, I was so young to religion, so I have a very different experience. But maybe I'll be the contrast to your experiences. We'll see. Fair. Okay, cool. Um, so, Dan, are you ready to be in the hot seat? I'm in the hot seat. Let's do it. Okay, cool. Robert and I will take turns. Yeah. Starting with pie or cake? Cake. Last thing you ate? Uh, crumpet. If you could do over any part of your day, which part would you do over? The morning. Driver or passenger? Driver. What did you do for self-care today? I had a long shower and I shaved. Mm. Number one celebrity crush? Matt Damon comes to mind. Mm. Ooh. Vanilla or chocolate? Vanilla. Books or films? Films. Is there anything that you might be addicted to? I'm addicted to lots of things. Coffee comes to mind. I think I've had coffee every day of my life for the last probably 25 years. 
Uh, would you slap a person or punch a person? I d- neither. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> and a song that stuck in your head. Bing bang bong, sing sang bing, song. Sang song. Bing bang bong, bing bang bong. UK Hun. So good. Hopefully, it's stuck in your head now too. <laughs> From UK Drag Race. I think the best place to end it is on a song. Love it. Love that. Mm. So, uh, ladies, gentlemen, non-binary friends, we are here today to talk about religion. And uh, I was telling my uh, guests and co-host off camera that I had a very powerful, dare I say, religious experience last night on drugs. And we'll definitely get into that a little bit. Um, But... Yeah, there will loosely be some themed discussions, but I want this to feel like a nice open chat. Um, So I'll just keep Dan in the hot seat for another minute. Um, Dan, what was one of the most significant moments where you questioned your relationship to religion? One of the most significant moments I questioned my relationship to religion, I went to Catholic school. So right up until I was 18, I was very Catholic. We had mass every Wednesday morning before school that I would go to. I would go to Sunday Mass as well. And my family was really religious too. Um, The big questioning part was when my gay self started to come towards the surface of my consciousness and come to the realization that it didn't fit with this routine of going to church twice a week and these believers who I was surrounded with. So that that was a big... um, big time of conflict when that awareness started coming to the forefront and with the Catholic Church it's not as it's not as clear as within the like a Christian assembly because I would go to Christian camp in the summer and in Christian camp you had to sign a contract that had a section H no uh, pornography no homosexual relationships and no sex before marriage so, mm-hmm. and because God looked down on it, that was always the, the thing. So it was really explicit there. But with the Catholic Church, it's uh, it wasn't so explicit. It was more around that, the Catholic guilt that people talk about and the judgmentalism, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. kind of learning that they thought that this was wrong, and then who I am and what I feel is wrong. So there was that sense of wow, I've grown up here, I know this, I've been an altar boy, I'm so involved in this, and all of a sudden. I don't belong here anymore. Oh gosh. Mm-hmm. Section H was that so that's not from Catholicism, that was from Christianity. Section H was the Ontario Pioneer Camp staff mm. contract. Oof. Wonder if it was just coincidence that it was related to homosexuality and it was called Section H. Yeah. I mean it could be. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Sometimes Christians can be very on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um wow. Uh And Robert, you sort of touched on it a second ago, but um, so you said you were quite young in the church. So what age did it stop like really mattering? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I didn't really have a choice in that. I was in the single digits by the time my family stopped going. So I have two older siblings, one two years older and one five years older. So there was a lot of time they spent in the church with kids, with a family in that. And from what I understand, my parents didn't have a very good relationship with the church they didn't really enjoy what was being spouted to begin with so even before i came into an age where i could really make decisions or even came to terms with my sexuality like i was out of the church um but i definitely remember going at a young age and just hating it just like Mm. it was classic kid like i am so bored i don't want to get up early on sundays i don't want to get into stuffy clothing and sit around when i was like i was a troublemaker kid like i when i was like elementary years I was a class clown I was causing trouble so like put me in a seat for too long and I would go nuts right um that has my... not changed no no <laughs> like, I'll, I'll be back <laughs> um my true moment of questioning probably came was later in life in high school where I was like you know what I fell out of the church I didn't really go back for any particular reason but I feel like I should be educated on it I should see like what is it like now because I had friends who went and they went to a youth group and I was like okay how about I check out what youth groups all about and it was probably grade 11 or 12 and one friend of mine went to youth group 
Ashley, and I decided to go with her. I think I had a bit of a crush on her, so clearly I hadn't come to terms yet with who I was. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go to her youth group, and the first half was wonderful. It was a bunch of kids who got together and played games and ran around and and act silly. I was like, great. You know, there was like indoor sports and stuff. There's almost a community center we're at. Then the second portion came, and they all gathered up, and I was actually singled out because they were like, we have somebody new here. And so they like targeted me to ask like why I was here, why I should stay, you know, like figured out like basically sort of like, it felt like they were identifying the weakness in me of like, what is the thing that bothers you or the reason that brought you here so that we can like focus on it. Hmm. And then what really, really though pushed me, I was just kind of like, that's awkward. I feel like I'm being singled out. But what really made it bad was when they got into the sermon, and the priest, I guess it would have been a priest, he started like his whole run through of his speech, his sermon was, he's like, you won't find fulfillment in anything, in your friends, in your job, in, uh, you know, your uh, family, in your partner, like nothing. Of course, I probably didn't use partner, but they were just like, it was this like very guilt based, like you will find fulfillment in nothing and you only find your whole self with God and you must completely give yourself up to God. And I got so angry at that concept. I was just like, that's that just destroys everything I've learned up to this point about how I should find gratitude and joy and all these other things in life. And suddenly they're meaningless. So I got really, really mad. But then what freaked me out, what was like, that was probably the clincher, but what like made me want to run and never return was they're like, all right, guys, now that we're done the sermon, we're going to bring out our young or like youth Christian rock band. And the like yes. a few of the students came up, suddenly had instruments from nowhere, pulled them out of their pockets or from the God's <laughs> door above them and like suddenly put together a band and started playing horrible <laughs> music. But it was religiously based, and suddenly the people who weren't playing went up to, like, the forefront of the, like, crowd and just started, like, hands in the air, waving, falling on the ground, like, shaking. Like, it was, like, something out of a horror film. Like, they were possessed, and I was like, I need to leave, and I never went back. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do you remember um, what denomination they might have been? It sounds like... um almost like a charismatic like <laughs> uh denomination i can't remember it was it was it was crazy the denomination yeah. of crazy because <laughs> <laughs> there are there are like subsections of christianity where it is about speaking in tongues and feeling the holy spirit and having these like yeah they call it holy ghosting um yeah. you know when people have these uh, convulsions, I guess, uh, yeah. because they're so inspired. Um, yeah. And it's fascinating. There's a great documentary called Jesus Camp that explores this effect like on like young, young children. Um, and yeah, it's it's powerful, especially like because of just the imagery of like these kids at what some of their parents may have thought was just a summer camp, but is really like this very intense, um, psychologically invasive, uh, <laughs> like process of, of spending time with each other oh yeah yeah and and it wasn't all of them like so it wasn't didn't feel like a coordinated effort but there was definitely like a good dozen of them out of the group probably 30 or so hmm wow um and then so for myself uh one of the most significant moments where i was questioning my relationship to religion was similar to dan because there was like i think i'd always known that i was queer or gay um and just didn't know how to like uh, describe it. So I first came out to some high school friends as bisexual because I was like, this is something I'm thinking about. And they were very accepting, very um, supportive. Uh, and like I was celibate, I wasn't really doing anything. So it was just like my little secret. Um, and then uh, in 2010, I did some work at a summer camp um, that was, you know, a Bible camp. So they had this whole like couple weeks sorry, week and a half of training where staff are doing all of that bonding and they're talking, they're having these like serious conversations about um, whether you should be allowed to date on camp. Uh, what is sexual purity look like on the, at the camp and all of these things. And they had um, purity bracelets that they went through this whole ceremony around um, to uh, just put, it was like a piece of like um, 
climbing rope or something. So it was made of plastic and could be melted on the one end so that it would stay on. Um, and yeah, we had a whole ceremony putting on these bracelets to like remind. And there was one, there was one uh, counselor who said, um, as a reminder to myself to m not masturbate, I put the bracelet on the hand that I usually use <laughs> to masturbate. <laughs> I thought he was going to put it on his penis. Yeah. And I was like, oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> um, so yeah, so just like a very vivid memory of that kind of like that purity and shame culture, um, especially at that summer camp. And at the same time, I was having such a powerful like social connection to a lot of these people at the camp that the things were very at odds in my mind. Like I felt like I got along really well with these people, but also this shame culture seems like a problem. So from that point, it started like, you know, two, almost three years of like really deep struggle and questioning about like how close I wanted to remain to the church. Um, and probably the major tension point was when I uh, developed a huge crush on a Christian guy and it was just not gonna go where I wished it could have oh, gone. No. Um, and it just took forever to let it go because I just really wanted that, like that sense of a peer, that sense of, you know, someone I could have like a deep connection with, a deep male connection with, mm -hmm. um, but he couldn't do it <laughs> is what it comes down to, both because he was homophobic, but also because of his own uh, insecurities as a person, to be honest. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that there, was the major one. There's a main point that you brought up, and I think we've all brought up that I find very interesting on this, is that there is this innate conflict that occurs between like that sense of community and the power and 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 like positivity it brings, combined with um, the like the negative guilt fear-based you know just like the ant antithesis of like this community element that brings you joy and and communion and togetherness and then this thing that makes you question all that and that's one of the yep. things i find really particularly sinister around it's like when you're in a position of power and then somebody uses that for wrong essentially you know it's very spider-man with great power comes great responsibility and when you have a community of people gathered together it's true a person in a position um, of that power within that community that's where I, I get so mad within religion um, because community is important to me. And I discovered a lot of that through improv and through my queer community. So, yeah, I, ugh, not a fan. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Did you have any other uh, thoughts on that subject, Dan? That like moment yeah, of change? Yeah, it's interesting. This whole kind of desire to be good and desire to please God and this righteousness and holiness that you tap into in these communities, right? Where it, it really does feel good to study the Bible and to have these pure friendships and especially within the camp context, you know? And it took me going to another camp to realize that that wasn't exclusive to the Christian environment. So I took a week off because one of my best friends at the time, he, when he was 16, he got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So he went and did his yeah. leadership training at another camp called Camp Ooch. And he loved it. And he's like, this camp is amazing. It's for kids who have cancer or who have survived cancer. You have to come and volunteer there. So we were doing program. We were running the program for the Christian camp. And we each took a week off and went to Ooch. And the difference was just staggering because you have this camp that is Christian and very exclusive. And then this other camp for kids who have or have survived cancer that is very inclusive. And you have within the doctrine of that camp inclusivity to say that cancer doesn't discriminate. So ne neither do we. We have um, professional gay people. <laughs> Professional gay. <laughs> professional Hooray. people who are gay. We do need payment. <laughs> professional gay. That's my Robert. Checks. Robert's a professional gay. I'm a professional gay. I get checks in the mail. <laughs> it says um, yes all over the envelope. And just that realization that, oh my God, the world is so much bigger. You know, when I was going to high school, yes. I was like, I don't know how you could have a high school without a shared moral code. Being a Catholic high school is so important to the community that we're building here. And then... I went to university and became a teacher and taught in the public system in Toronto. And my view completely changed. I don't know how you could have a school that abides by a single 
moral spiritual code. It is so unrepresentative of society and such a ridiculous, exclusionary, judgmental gathering, you know, and it's entrenched in the provincial makeup of, of Ontario. You have all of these Catholic schools that are publicly funded. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, growing up in them, I just thought it was so valuable. And then graduating from that and going back to it, I just think it's so damaging and so wrong. Like, why wouldn't you have a mix of all the kids in society together learning? Why does it have to be Catholic? And, you know, 25% of the kids are Catholic in a Catholic school. 75%, you know, could care less. They don't go to church. They mm -hmm. don't, you know, and it's very Catholic, even though it's not, there's a crucifix in every room. And only oh, after right. you're in the public system and you go back to the Catholic system and you realize that it is, it is so <laughs> pervasive, this religious symbolism and this presence of religion everywhere, you, you begin not to see the crucifixes on every single classroom wall until you go back in. And then you realize, oh my God, I didn't see how pervasive this was. I didn't mm. see the scriptures up on the walls in the hallway and that kind of stuff. Was this stuff. in the public system too? Or are you talking only the Catholic ones? No, there weren't crucifixes in the classrooms in the public system, Robert. Oh, okay. okay. No. Nice. I, was just like, I was like, oh gosh, I was like, how pervasive is it? Because I, when I was really young, for three years, I lived in Ontario. And the one thing I do remember is that every morning we would do the Canadian national anthem over the PA system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we didn't do that out west. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a thing at all. Uh, and I always remember them being like, this is interesting. Kind of like, it felt very American, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah, mm. that is definitely a thing. I can't remember if I maybe it doesn't happen here in BC. But yeah, in Ontario, every morning there's the anthem. And then when I was a teacher, you'd go out and stand in the hall and stop kids because kids would be late at that point. If they hadn't made it in the class by the anthem, they'd be late. So they try, try to sneak into class. And so all the teachers have to go out and force people to stop. And you have to stay standing Whoa. still for the anthem. So it's like kids were in trouble. And so they would just try to like sneak wow. as the anthem is going. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> I mean, there's a lot going on there too, in the sense that like, uh, a uh, what do you call a nationalist country sort of like brought together under an anthem or a pledge of allegiance or whatever um like i don't think it's such a coincidence that america also has a similar thing of like the pledge of allegiance and um you know people learning a bunch of american patriotic songs and that meme uh earlier in the aughts of america being a christian nation like we are one nation under God, the Christian God kind of thing, which just like, I don't know. I, I don't know if we'll get into that subject specifically, but there is something very colonialist about um, white Christianity and like missions and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, that I didn't even think about, was not even crossing my mind when I was so entrenched in it. But like you're saying, Dan, once you're out of that culture and you realize, um, like you said, the world is so much bigger, other cultures take their beliefs just as seriously and are just as valid um that yeah you start to feel like oh yeah oh it's not it's not that serious community exists outside of this religious context that was one of the biggest fear pieces around my family leaving the church where were we mm -hmm. going to get married where were we going to baptize our children where we were going to have funerals mm -hmm. You know, mm. if you don't have that community for those major life events, who's going to do that for you? And I realized mm. coming to Vancouver and joining what was now Queer Prov, that's our community. You know, that's that's who's going to be arranging the funeral. That's going to be who we're inviting to weddings. That's who we're going to be mm. welcoming kids into the world. You know, like your community doesn't have to be this <laughs> like stamp of approval from some archaic religion that's telling you how to live it's mm. and that's the that's our new queer definition it's our chosen family it's our chosen community yeah yeah not the one that's that you're awesome. obliged to um all right so i'm going to move to our next little section uh what dan in your opinion it's a deep question what do you believe religion faith-based religion needs to adapt uh to remain relevant today charity and helping people mm. right it's like nothing strikes me as more of an ironic juxtaposition than the jehovah's witness people standing in nice clothes beside the people who are begging for money 
you see that I can be can be subway all the time, right? You've got the two or three Jehovah's Witnesses with their Watchtower magazines, and then you've got right on the other side of the doorway people begging for money and hungry, and it's like I I am always struck when I see that juxtaposition around religion into recruitment mode instead of service mode. And I think that the whole purpose of religion is to comfort the sick and to help the poor and to do works of charity towards fellow people. If religion focused more on that and less on the good bad paradigm, I think that would allow them to be relevant. They will never be relevant to me. I could give mm-hmm. two fucks about religion. That's mm-hmm. it. One is like, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't, I can't even name the fucks. I, I don't know why I chose two. <laughs> yeah. what, what, <laughs> there's two of them. One is it? One, one fuck is like, are they bothering people? And number two, are they, fuck number two. You know, are they? Is it a cult? <laughs> are they tricking? Are they yeah. tricking people? Are they bothering yeah. people? Or are they tricking people? Those are the two fucks I have to give about religion. Other than that. I have nothing, oh no, no more care about religion. Quote it's, of the day. It is just ridiculous. <laughs> I find religion to be ridiculous. If you really want to push me on it, I can go further. I also think it's make pretend. Yeah, the third fuck. I think it's make pretend. <laughs> I think religion is all, it's completely BS. I think it's imaginary friend zone. It is like this crazy political thing that is meant to control people <laughs> through guilt. Yes. And, yes. Uh, yes. And I'm over it. I'm over it. I've had it officially. <laughs> oh, it's happened. She's had it officially. Um, Robert, what about you? Oh, what do you okay. think they need to change to remain relevant? Because I have a lot to say. I don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm going to put a point on that and also highlight a thing that Dan said that I think is very apt is that religion, if you go way back in the days, was essentially built for control, right? Like it, it was, mm-hmm. it was like a bunch of people telling tales that people started believing and they started using it to guide them and, and, and um, influence them. And then they started gathering together and forming a thing with a name and it was religion. And, you know, like it, it was about somebody in a position of power asserting influence and control through narrative. And then we have a thousand and one different versions of those narratives and, and religions, all those things today. So I think that's huge. And I think it still remains true to today. So that brings me to my second point around the question is that I am going to drop one of my favorite quotes of all time. It is added by by Alvin Toffler, who is a futurist, I believe. And it is that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be th- will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. And I think that Damn. is very true of religion, that wow. until religion can learn to rewrite, to change and to adapt they will not be relevant into the future. And the only religions I feel have started to do that and have some kind of a diverse, modern mm, approach are those who have tried that, who are like, oh, you know, we're going to allow in the gays and we're going to teach about other faiths and we're going to teach about other family types and, and genders and that. They're attempting it. They still probably have a whole bunch of other shit and baggage. And I'm not going to point out any one particular religion or faith-based group because I don't know enough about them. But they definitely, regardless of which one it is, need to learn how to rewrite because they innately have a problem that they're still living by this book, this doctrine, this way of being that was written hundreds or thousands of years ago. And that just doesn't work because we change as people. Damn. Can you, uh, I'm going to just have to replay that quote one more time. Who said it? Um, the one you Toffler. said about. Okay. All right. That's a good one. Mm-hmm. Learning and relearning. Sorry, learning, unlearning, and relearning. To learn, relearn, and unlearn. Those wow. are those who cannot do that are the illiterate of the 21st century. Wow. Wow. That okay. So I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna talk about my religious experience last night. <laughs> Brace yourselves. Um, Get your ukuleles. Um, so I got <laughs> <laughs> religious ukuleles. <laughs> so I got very high. Um, and it, it appears that getting high <laughs> is like leading me to have very profound experiences lately. Um, and it, it, I wouldn't even say it's a crush because I haven't like a crutch rather, cause I haven't had anything for like three or four weeks. Um, but yeah, it was a deep one. So basically <sighs> the theme was, I deserve love. The theme was 
like unconditional self-acceptance, um, which has been an ongoing theme in uh, my therapy, in my artistic work, um, and in my relationships. Um, I'm what's called an avoidant attacher, which basically means like I very often crave independence because sometimes deep down, I don't feel like I'm good enough to provide the needs for this other person. I don't feel like I have the energy to like create that intimacy. So I come up with ways to create space between myself and the other person and like not um, not show up. So how that ties into religion and like what faith-based religions need, in my opinion, is to focus on unconditional love. I think like that is the promise of Jesus and Christianity or like the cell um, that this guy unconditionally loved humanity so much mm -hmm. that he then died and like tried to take place of their sins. But that first part, you can actually have unconditional love for your fellow people um, and not have to die over it. You don't have to become a martyr. Um, and I think the reason it sticks so much in my craw as my mic <laughs> becomes unstable, um, Just it's like God telling you something. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the reason that, uh, yeah, strikes such a chord with me is because I've seen directly the impact that being a missionary kid has had on people in my family. Um, and how, that sense of obligation um, from their parents created a totally fucked up dynamic um, where, you know, it's like people pleasing, it's proving your worth, it's like love becoming conditional, both for your parents, but also for God, for this supposed cosmic universal overseer, which is like too much for any child to actually handle. Um, and like, yeah, this person in my family is like still dealing with those wounds today um, because that sense of love being conditional then led to feelings of abandonment, feelings of severe loneliness, unworthiness, depression, all of these things. And if I if I have my two fucks to give about religion, it's about martyrdom and it's about learned helplessness because martyrdom says like, I am so important. I'm so correct. I'm so like special with this belief that I'm willing to die. I'm willing to hurt people. I'm willing to like just put everything on the line for this belief and not listen and not learn about other points of view and learned helplessness is just this idea that like this sent like this deep, deep unworthiness as a person that like just becomes debilitating. And in the worst cases, like it causes people to take their own lives. Like there are plenty of queer people. There are plenty of, I'm sure like straight people um, who feel just this sense of like wrongness because of the idea of sin that um, that it's too much. They just feel like they're not measuring up. And some of that is Christianity. Some of that is like other cultural stuff. But like, yeah, it's just, you know, it takes a it's taken me so, so long to unpack. Um, and like just last night, I felt like I was like exercising the demons, like <sighs> really like pushing out all the tears, all the grief, all the like loss and like in some sense, like lost time, um, just spent like worrying about whether I was good enough. Like, it's just that it's the classic story, this, you know, Yeah, it, it's the cosmic report card, right? It's like. I knew that being gay was on my cosmic report card. So I had to make up for that by getting good grades, by being the student mm. council president, by being a good friend, by doing charity work. All that was to make up for the mark that I was getting for being gay on the cosmic report card. And this whole idea of sin that you're talking about and not being worthy and being judged and, you know, and, and cast out because of being gay or any kind of sin i think that's the power that you're talking about robert in terms of the church having power over people and in terms of mm. where religion came from in the first place to explain natural phenomenon and then yeah. to keep people in their place to keep them scared yeah. to have that power structure and so you have that legacy and it becomes very problematic that people have to buy in to the fact that we are guilty of original sin 
and then subsequent sin. And the only way to absolve that guilt is to let this imaginary friend into your heart and to become a martyr for this cause that is bigger than all of us. And I've come to the point in my life where I say that's, that's like for kids. And, and on your point, Dan, of like the getting the, like the gay section of your report card. So you almost by default were getting like an F on that because you were supposed to be Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, because you kind of failed on that one, right? To be non-gay, you failed that. So then every other section, you had to be like an A++++, right? To be able to overcome that like grade that you will never pass on because you were innately born that way. Yeah, I don't know Oof. if I would have been so driven in my life if I didn't have that desire to compensate. Yeah, yeah. Good, good thing real. you just didn't get a really big car because then that would have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been a, a waste of your talents. Yeah. Um, Robert, is it OK if we go maybe like 15 minutes over? Yeah. It's OK, Dan, you. is that OK with you? Mm -hmm. OK, cool. Um, wow. OK, so we've already really touched on it, but just to be plain as day for people and maybe for a clip for social media. Hey um, <laughs> uh, Dan, as a queer person, what is the like number one? beef with religion the number one struggle with it the number one struggle for me as a queer person around religion is this belief that being queer is wrong that you are not worthy of love unless you are sorry for being queer and that it is somehow a sin to act on your queerness and that notion excludes, damns, and separates our community and queers from non-queers. And it is the most destructive and brutal attack to bear as a queer person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Robert, how about you? It is like similar to Dan's. I think we'll probably all have a similar answer to this. I'm going to abstract it out a little bit. Um, to say that I think religion is a perpetrator of this and other people and probably <laughs> their origin of it comes from religion, but it's to say that I think it is really screwed up to say for somebody to feel wrong in as simple a concept as to say, I understand who I want to love. That's it, right? Like to understand that you're queer is to say, I understand myself and who I want to love in life. And that is such a simple, pure thing. Like, if you want to talk simple and pure religion? Well, like, why would you put any effort, any cycles, any time into stopping somebody from wanting to love when there's so many other evils in the world to fight? Like poverty and, uh, you know, malnutrition and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. and Political the, corruption. <laughs> yeah, like so many other things to put your time into than to stop people who are just saying, like, I want to love. Simple. Yeah. Yeah. I I second both of those and to like add one is just that that idea of being able to love the sinner but hate the sin. Mm -hmm. I just think it's impossible. There's no way that you can say that phrase without a tone of judgment, without a tone of like keeping somebody at arm's length or um yeah, deciding what you both just said of like, well, there's something wrong about that person but they're deserving of love. And it's just like this arms crossed, just like condescending look at someone who's marginalized when really that person could probably use, uh, you know, unconditional acceptance. It's this like this tension between like, you know, toxic religion wants your approval and like true community accepts you just as you are, you know? <sighs> yeah, that's what the, there's a, a I think it's sort of like when you pull somebody in with one hand and you slap them with the other, you know, like it's mm -hmm. the, I don't remember the turn of phrases, but it's kind of that like, like I'm going to pull you in and I love you, but look out, bam. Yeah. What yeah, you yeah, do yeah. is wrong. You'd be like, that's such a like, talk about screwing somebody up. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, yeah. Ugh. It's totally backhanded. Yeah. And like, I think that's the reason why it can feel so isolating in, um, yeah, in churches as queer people or as marginalized people. Like Dan earlier was talking about this exclusivity. Like 
If you're a person where you know on some level that you are not included in this group, but you feel like you're going to lose community going in, uh, lose community leaving it, then there is that tension of like, but this is the this is the best kind of love and camaraderie that I'm capable of. I can make it work. Surely something is just wrong with how I'm dealing with it. And it all just like comes back to the self and like how we're somehow wrong instead of this environment is, you know, toxic. Yeah, on that love the sin or hate the thing, hate, hate the sin thing, that's such a complicated mm -hmm. one. Uh, in yeah. one breath, I love that because it promotes a general love of people. We can love everyone. Mm -hmm. So you take someone who's murdered someone and instead of labeling them murderer, garbage, you know, gone, ex exclude that piece around there. They have worth because they're alive. Every person. Mm -hmm has that sacred worth around life has been breathed into you from somewhere that is still the mystery that for me is spirituality that value of life how can you hold yep. that and then the hate the sin part is where the judgmentalism comes in that's where that condescending piece comes in that you talked about david where it's like who decides what's sin i think some things we can agree yep. upon right you steal something from someone else you hurt someone else you murder someone else why are we lumping in same-sex love in that mm -hmm. category you know so i think this definition of sin and who gets to decide and that it's based on these out of date books that have been transcribed and passed down and translated and changed for political reasons you can't say that this is the ultimate definition of sin no sin you know that and and when you're arguing with someone and it comes down to the bible the argument's over. You can't argue with that. You know, I remember I was talking to mm -hmm. Andrew Job once around this idea around flat earth and arguing with people uh, about the earth is flat versus the earth, earth is round. And when they came to him with the retort, because it's in the Bible, he said, well, we, the conversation's over. If that's where we're going to end, you know, that's it. If you believe that the Bible is absolute and I don't, then the, then the real argument is, is done. That's where we verge. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Because that is, I distinctly remember a meeting with a um, youth pastor where he was like interviewing me so he could be a reference for working at this Christian summer camp. And one of the subjects we uh, touched on was um, he asked, do you believe that the Bible is like the unerrant word of God? And I like I absolutely at the time said, well, I have to, don't I? <laughs> and it was just that total like, like light bulb moment. And like, just looking back on that, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I really thought I had to. <laughs> um, and that was just like, that was kind of the beginning of like some of those deeper questions and like continuing to work at that camp, but also wondering like, well, how much of this is the unerrant word of God and not just translated, reworded, changed by people, you know? That's so true. Um, wow. I honestly think... I, I feel good. I feel like I've unloaded something. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm ready to. I'm ready to get to the fun of our show. To I don't know, just let some stuff out. Robert, I was wondering mm. if we could do. Oh boy, if we could do an open scene because I, I think what? Dan is a wonderful improviser. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 So, gosh. Um, yeah, maybe we'll start with two people. Third person could walk in. Well, we, we've done improv. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you want zero foley on this one. <laughs> uh, no foley. If you want to, I mean, if you want to make little sound effects with your mouth, anyone can do it. Okay. Um, let me just see a random word generator. Oh my word. Uh, word generator. Hmm. Our random word is mosaic. Oh, mosaic. <laughs> this is an open scene inspired by mosaic. Okay. Is it, mm, is it lopsided? I need some more red tiles. Okay. Okay. Red red tiles on the left or on the right? Are you thinking? 
Well, if you're feeling lopsided, I would go on the left. Yeah. Okay. 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 Oh gosh. It's so good that we could spend this time together. The community is going to love this. They definitely are. You know, I, I really think, have you, have you considered consulting? Have you considered, you know, being like a, a sort of like brand awareness type person for the community center? Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, I'm just getting this sense that like, you're like really in touch with like what the community needs. Um, and I'm not. Well, this place saved my life. Um, how, how so? I, I was not aware. Oh, yeah. When I came to North Vancouver, I had no plan. I was sleeping wherever I could. I was couch surfing and, um, it was only this community center that took me in for two weeks and I met everyone here and it's been my real ladder. Holy, did you, how are you able to find a job? Are you working right now? I work here. I work on the Tuesday night outreach and then I run the library on Fridays and the group on Saturdays. The community center has been my employer, I guess, for gosh, two years. Oh my word. Wow. Okay. They must, they, they, they sound super generous. Cause like the contract they gave me for installing this mosaic was like, it was like better than most contracts I receive. I'll say that. Well, one of our missions is to recognize the value of artists to have you consulting Whoa. here on this work. That's going to stay in the middle of the center. It It's a big deal. We want you to feel like you've been really recognized in the contract. Wow, I super appreciate that. Um, all right, so it's looking like a pretty symmetrical maple leaf um, with the red on the left, and then it sort of like skews toward pink on the right. Um, is it shiny enough? Can I ask you something? Yeah, sure. Are you single? Yes, yes, I am single. Are, are, are you single? Why do you ask? <laughs> I'm recently single, actually. Oh, oh my, oh my gosh. Working for the community and finding time to date. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm new to it and I'm bad at it. That's why I asked. <laughs> uh, uh, fair, yes, it is not, it is not easy. Oh, uh, do you think, do you think they're single? Oh, <laughs> I actually know that they are not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, that's fair. Um, wow. Wow, that's cool. Well, uh, I'm just gonna, I have to put some glaze on this tile. How much longer is your Oh, shift? you dropped your, here. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, how much longer are you working? Uh, well, I don't really, uh, I don't really consider it a shift, you know? I'm just here until, well, I guess I'll start making dinner. <laughs> oh, my word. Wow. Um, I mean, you don't have to make dinner tonight if you don't want to. Hi, I'm I'm so sorry. I don't mean to bother oh, you. Yeah. Is this the North Vancouver Community Center? Yes. Hi, welcome. Uh, I, I mean, I don't work here. Um, uh, my friend, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Bruce. Bruce. Oh. Bruce works here. Bruce. I didn't see you there. Hi. Um, <laughs> How's it going? It's been a while. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it has been a while. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't uh, think you'd still be doing shifts here. Uh, uh nice mosaic. Um, are you are you both working you. on this? Uh, is this a is this a duo project? Uh, Bruce is consulting. <laughs> oh, you're 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 consulting now. This is Jordan. Uh, <laughs> Jordan used to be a DJ. Are you still doing DJ work? Jordan. Oh, sorry. I I, would, I just yeah. Um. It's it's not doing so well, uh, I, you know. Ever hmm. ever since the breakup, it's it's been I, I've been all over the place, you know. Hmm. Uh, how are, how are you? How, how's you're clearly doing a lot of work. I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, that's. Um, and how do you two know each other? He's consulting. Oh, so it's it's just 
purely business, you know. He he comes here a lot. He's 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 worked at the screening center a lot. He's done a yeah. lot for them. He's is every, he's is done, everything he does okay? a lot. He's a yeah. Are you, are you in a rush or something? I, I was I was here for um one of the hot yoga classes, but you know, I don't need to go. I can I can leave. Um, is it weird? Oh. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's just hot yoga. Why would it be weird? I'm already sweating. Clearly, I don't need to go in. Uh, sh- uh, I mean, Bruce, ca- is there any problem with joining a hot yoga class after it started? No, no, no. They'll they'll let you in. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think you'll still be here afterwards? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing the um, the hot dinner tonight, so we got to start cooking in about a half hour. <laughs> Everything's hot in this community center, right? <laughs> I, I guess so, man. Uh, <laughs> um, wow. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like hot dinner, hot yoga, hot guys, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just, totally. Wow, <laughs> it's hot out today. Eh? Um. So, uh, 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 it's, um, you guys, you've done great work. I love the pink through the red. Thanks. Uh, oh, yeah, that was that was mostly me. You know, I, I sent some designs ahead of time, and they were like, "We love it." So I'm just putting some glaze on now. <laughs> um, how how long are you two gonna work on this project for? Um, I, I was just wrapping up. Uh, I don't know if Bruce was busy, but um, well, we got to yeah. glaze and then let it set, and uh, yeah. we'll exactly. probably come back tomorrow and do a little bit of sanding and and some touch ups. Yeah. But it it's close to done. <laughs> this is two thousand yeah. five hundred pieces. 2,500. Yeah. Wow. I hate to count all those, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, they get pretty meticulous in shipping. But other than that, I just trust what's in the box, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so, are, like, are, is like a, each piece representative of like people? Like, are you, do you, are you two up here somewhere? <laughs> it, it could, it could be. Um, you know, I, I did float this idea of making it uh, possible to like pin donors. Uh, around the flag and stuff so there's like a little space in the grout where you could uh yeah put some uh mounting but no other than that it's 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 meant to uh it's meant to include everybody include the whole community yeah yeah yeah, that makes sense um you want to you want everybody included right you don't want to leave anybody out you know like yeah it's uh it's hard sometimes you feel like you're left behind and you're you you know things aren't working out your career's going nowhere and suddenly you can't book any more dj gigs (laughs) you know do you guys want to have a threesome Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> no. Okay, sweet. Let's do it. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've got to go cook. Um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll leave you two at it. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Just, All right. I'm just going to stand here and sweat. <laughs> sounds good. It's surprisingly good for sex. See? Bruce, I'm still in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good work. <laughs> and two, see. three, one of the threesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I i don't i said it once mm. while you were talking so i think it got cut out <laughs> oh there was a couple moments where the, like the audio um stuttered like delayed the yeah no worries <laughs> oh. oh good shit good uh. shit that was nice <laughs> that felt nice <laughs> um i feel like that scenario has happened somewhere yeah yeah that was very grounded <laughs> not super crazy <laughs> um Gosh. So that brings us to the end of today's show. Dan, do you have anything you want to take away from this conversation? You know, I've been thinking as the conversation has evolved around how improv is my new religion and how the Mm -hmm. community that we create that's inclusive around improv and the practice of improvisation is what has replaced religion for me. So this Mm. notion of creating with people and deepening relationships through this art form, it has really occurred to me today that that has taken that important place in my life. Mm. Totally. How about you, Robert? Um, (laughs) It's interesting for me because I have had less exposure to religion and I feel like you both obviously have a lot of baggage that came from that history of with it. So like I have less baggage, but I'm like, I'm equally as screwed up as both these people. So where did my (laughs) shit come from? I feel like I just need to investigate more and find out because (laughs) religions messed me up to an extent, but more other people in my life. Mm. Mm. That's fair. We all got some stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. For me, you know, my major takeaway I think is similar to what Dan was saying of like, 
I think just growing up in that religious space, like having your eyes opened to the possibility for community, I think just creates that longing, that um, almost like responsibility to find like what the best version of that is. And like, you don't rest until you find that, like what feels right <laughs> about that. Um, wow. So thanks again, Dan. Um, we mentioned before, you can check out typeropetheater.com to check out the uh, theater and improv classes that Dan Come teaches. Join my religion. Well some other teachers. <laughs> yeah, join his religion. <laughs> it's not a cult. <laughs> but you gotta pay. Um, you do have to pay, but it's uh, fair. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for listening to Tissues of the Day. Uh, you can follow David at Bitbutton. That's me <laughs> at Bitbutton on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow Robert at Robert F. Mackay on Instagram. Stay wet, Internet. Dripping. Wow. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>